This is the midweek edition of your Barbados Today Evening News Update. Central Bank Governor Clevenston Haynes is predicting that the Barbados economy could grow between 7 to 9 percent if the tourism sector rebounds next year. He made the comments as he addressed the quarterly general meeting of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association this morning. But we cannot ignore the reality that a robust performance by the tourism sector is needed to generate foreign exchange earnings and accelerate growth in support of government's fiscal consolidation efforts and promotion of debt sustainability. With the prospects for a stronger, sustained recovery of the sector, we anticipate growth of at least 7 to 9% in 2022. However, over the medium term, by targeting overall growth of at least 3% per annum over a sustained period, we can shorten the horizon for attaining our debt target. Tourism has a critical role to play in achieving this objective. Chairman of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, Jeffrey Roach, today served notice that he is stepping down from the post. Roach, who has been at the helm for the last 18 months, says he will be vacating the position at month end. That is with a sense of sadness that I must inform the membership. I will be stepping down as chairman of the BHD at the end of December 2021, which is a few weeks time. This has been brought on by the fact that British on Cruise Terminals Inc. will cease to operate the cruise terminal at December 31st of this year. And as such, we will be moving in the not too distant future to end up the operations of the, the company. So with BCTI no longer being a member of the BHD, I am unable to continue as chairman uh, based on our constitution. There will be no shortage of food this Christmas. That's the assurance of Minister of Tourism and International Transport, Senator Lisa Cummins, who says that despite the disruptions in global supply chains, the country has enough food reserves that will be able to supply both local and tourism demand over the busy holiday period. There is no doubt in anyone's minds here, and we've all been watching the news, we've all been seeing globally what is happening with supply chain interruptions. Everyone has seen what's happening globally. Certainly, I, I can say that from my own perspective, uh, both as the Minister responsible for tourism and as the chairman of the CTO, we have been speaking across the region and locally with suppliers about what is going to happen with the supply chain. And we are comfortable that we have adequate supplies both locally and regionally in order to go through the winter season, both locally and to ensure that people who are visiting our shores have adequate supplies. But it is the inefficiencies that may exist in the logistics chain that will cause challenges. While tabling the facilitation of the International Maritime Traffic Bill 2021, Senator Cummins also pointed out that government is working to address inefficiencies at the port in an effort to keep the cost of goods down. And so once goods land in Barbados or ships are inbound to Barbados, it is in our interest to ensure that we clear those goods as quickly as possible without incurring any further delays in port, any further charges in port, any further costs therefore associated with those delays, including the merge charges, Mr. President, which are as a result of those kinds of delays, which will then have an impact, a detrimental impact on the cost for the consumer. So we can't control what happens globally. We can't control what happens uh, in the international supply chain, but we can mitigate the impact of further increases as a result of implementing port efficiencies and logistics chain efficiencies, such as the implementation of the maritime single window, the electronic single window, a port community system, a secure world functioning effectively, and all of the agencies being on board and online and clearing goods in real time. In other news this Wednesday, despite the several setbacks and challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, Senior Youth Commissioner Elizabeth Boyne says young people are still eager to make themselves job ready as they pursue new opportunities in the world of work. She was speaking on the sidelines of the Ministry of Youth's Get Hired program today. For the seminar, most persons are looking to gain employment because the young persons coming to the seminar are job ready what we call the, the job ready because they've met the criteria of being 75% or more ready in terms of having the requisite skill sets. They would have had previous work experience and the, day, the preliminary day would have also exposed them or refreshed them to areas that employers are looking for in terms of the attributes, um, in terms of time management, in terms of team building interpersonal skills. We, the, the, day, the preliminary day is ready to prepare them adequately to exude 
a level of confidence that would enable the young the employer to make a concrete decision about whether they meet the standards for their organization. Now to the latest COVID-19 update. Four people died from the viral illness over the last two days, bringing the death toll to 244. On Monday, a woman aged 61 passed away at the Harrison Point Isolation Facility. Additionally, three people died on Tuesday. A 61-year-old man succumbed to COVID-19 at the Harrison Point Isolation Facility, and an 86-year-old man passed away at the Accident and Emergency Department of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and a 93-year-old man died at the Blackman and Gollop Isolation Facility. They were all unvaccinated. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, my name is Michelle Hines and I own a company called HM Novelties. I have three children, two of which are under the age to get the vaccine and that makes them vulnerable. And the eldest, she is vaccinated and that's a good thing because all she wants to do is hang with her friends. I take care of my 80 year old mum and she has many comorbidities. And I love my mom, and I would not want for anything to happen to her. I am one of the ones that suffered absolutely no symptoms for either the first or the second jab. When you have the vaccine, you have a weapon to fight against this virus, to fight against this beast. 95% of my friends and family are vaccinated, and that literally makes me feel secure. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To regional news now, the Jamaica government has announced the relaxation of the seven-hour curfew and the mandatory work-from-home order for the public sector will continue until year-end as the country moves to further curb the spread of the coronavirus pandemic that has killed 2,411 people and infected 91,554 people since March last year. We get the details from TVJ News. Prime Minister Andrew Holness came to the House of Representatives on Tuesday with changes to the COVID-19 containment measures effective December 10 to January 14. First up, the curfew hours. The curfew hours will be from 10 p.m. nightly to 5 a.m. the following morning. So we have moved the curfews up one hour through this period. On December 24, Christmas Eve or Grand Market, arguably the busiest shopping day of the year, different curfew hours will apply. Curfew will commence past midnight and start at 1 a.m. early Christmas morning. So and for New Year's Eve, for New Year's Eve night, December 31st, the curfew will commence after midnight at 1 a.m. early on New Year's Day. On the international front, Sudan was unable to access $650 million in international funding in November when the assistance was paused after a coup, the finance minister of the dissolved government says, a move that could jeopardize basic import payments and the fate of economic reforms. We get more in this report from Reuters TV. The freeze puts in doubt basic import payments and the fate of economic reforms. Ibrahim, who was appointed to a civilian transitional government in February, said the main impact would be on development projects covering areas including water supply, electricity, agriculture, health and transport. He said he hoped international support would return gradually over the next three to six months. Meanwhile, bills could be paid and reforms would continue. Basically, we depend on tax, customs and gold revenues and on different state companies working in various fields. Ibrahim said Sudan would seek investment rather than grants from wealthy Gulf Arab states that now face their own economic challenges. That's news, but for the very latest, you can visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media and Bus Terminals, as well as Screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Capital Media HD, 99.3 FM.